incremental improvements. So, yes? Dynamic IP arranges, thank you. Um, so generally speaking, we are spending a lot on in, um, these, on resources, of resources on these incremental improvements. We are at the far end of the 80-20 rule, right? We had the easy stuff coming on with 20% of our resources, and now we're spending 80% of our resources to solve the last 20%. Part of our problem is that our problems are actually what I'd like to call gray or fuzzy. But our technology solutions tend to be binary. So we understand what hap has to happen technically, but we don't really understand all of the behavioral pieces that have to go with it. So when you find yourself in a hole, we, you know, the expression says stop digging. Now for those of you who ha actually know me beyond this topic, this is a little pun because I am like a total DNS junkie, so when I saw so, you know, top stop digging was a little pun. What are the other areas of science that can help us? Can we get an assist maybe from the soft sciences? And if so, which ones are we going to get this assist from? A little history here on um, some of this. I took an educational psychology class uh, about five years ago because I was thinking about leaving the field and just becoming a teacher and corrupting the youth. Um, not in terms of teaching them how to hack, but in terms of teaching them how to question the oppressors or the authority, whatever way you want to consider it. And I thought it would be good to um, get out there and, like I said, just take on and like, corrupt the next generation. But um, I, decided, I, I, realized, I came to the realization that I like wine way too much and good chocolate, and I would not be able to have the wines and chocolate that I like with the teacher's salary, so I said I better stick with what I'm doing. I did learn some things out of my educational psychology class, though. I learned that there are different ways that uh, people learn. There are different ways that their culture affects their learning and how you have to teach them accordingly. So the thought kind of stuck with me, and I thought, you know, we all always look at um, how we can do things in terms of uh, that we have criminals that are psychologically profiled. Um, can, we comp can we profile computer network attacks then? Because isn't that kind of a criminal behavior? And if so, to what degree and what aspects can we do this on? So when, when we look into profiling computer network attack behavior, we have to consider that one, this is not about the individual. This is about groups of people, cultures. Um, trying to do it with the individual, with the knowledge base that is there right now, would be an impossible task. Groups would be good, but we lack foundational information. So where do we get it? Well, it turns out that some of the countries out there have some foundational information for us. And historically, there has been working um, groups within the government that look at linguistics. But I think that we should go beyond linguistics. There's more to it than just the language. We see differences in cultures all throughout all other aspects. Think about art and dance. Um, um, you think like folk stories and folk dances and things like that. It's always the same story. You know, girl sees boy, boy sees girl, girl wants to flirt with boy, boy, boy wants to impress girl, you know, and they tell these stories and dance in their, their art, but they do it all in slightly different ways. Another way that we see it, um, I'm a big soccer fan. I see a DC United shirt here in the audience. <laughs> I uh, really, really love watching the World Cup every year. And one of the things, oh, not every year, every four years. But um, one of the things that jumps out at you is the difference in the style of play amongst the different nations. Watch Brazil, watch Spain, watch Germany, watch England. All very uh, good teams, and yet they all have very different styles. So. It's, this is kind of starting to lend to this idea that countries do do things differently. Customs uh, also, but we, want to, we suspect this is not as vital, but it's just kind of out of scope getting into the, the specific customs of these cult, um, nations. So it turns out that um, my research took me to a couple of different professors who have done some good work, but the, the um, I guess, the father of all of this is a Dr. Hofsteed out of the Netherlands. And his quote is, culture is defined as the collective mental programming of the human mind, which distinguishes one group of people from another. Ding, 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 ding. This is like, wow, this was like, yay, found something good here. Um, the collective mental programming of the human mind. This is this not what we're trying to find. Is how, if we understand how the human mind is programmed, then we can anticipate the next move that the human mind will make. 
This does not, re he put together this fantastic matrix. Um, I still, uh, I'm, I'm using it a lot of people. It's become the baseline for cultural dimensions in lots of different study areas. And his matrix, um, some, some things you have to be aware of, does not reflect differences between individuals. It reflects differences between different countries. Um, the statements about cultures are general, and more importantly, they're relative. And by relative, he means they're relative to each other in the matrix. And of course, the appeal of culture lies in the fact that people's thought processes subconsciously reflect their cultural background. So while it's not great for individual hacker attribution, it has cyber warfare implications because you're able to say, I can, again, I can look and watch the behavior and people don't re really change the way they formulate a problem and put together their alternatives to solve the problem. This is something that we've just, we've learned growing up and we, this is how we process information. So the, there are good defensive, obviously, um, plays for this, but then the thought was if we're able to put all this together and come up with a good defensive um, taxonomy, and I understood what another culture looked like, then there's an offensive play on this because then I would go ahead, if I wanted to do an attack, I would cloak myself as somebody else and uh, try to exhibit their behaviors when I wanted to go ahead and attack another site. So we're thinking the markers should reveal themselves even in reused attacks because it may, not, it, it may not be just simply looking at the code but looking at the choices in which uh, people pull things together and the order in which they do things. Now, Dr. Hofstede identified four different cultural dimensions. Power distance, um, this has to deal with how far an individual, the, the society has their individuals from the decision making loop. So uh, a good way to think of it is hierarchical societies versus um, egalitarian societies. Now you had individual versus collective. Um, do we reward individualistic efforts or do we put the group above the individual? Masculine, fem feminine. Um, is the culture more of a paternal or a masculine view of the world or do they have a feminine one? I'm going to get into this a little more later in a couple slides too, so if it seems like I'm rushing through it, don't worry about it. Uncertainty avoidance. Uh, do you, are you comfortable living in that gray area or do you have to have uh, a strong sense of what's What's ne the next step? Then we've had others that added to the model. Bond added a good uh, pair. He added long-term orientation versus immediate results. And then Minkoff added two, um, the, he's in the process actually of adding his, indulgence versus restraint and monumentalism versus self-effacement. Now the last one, monumentalism versus self-effacement, really caught my eye because historically there have been groups where when somebody does an attack, they will leave a monument in the code, say, ha 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 ha, you know, I did this and I'm so and so, I'm so great, or, you know, for the glory of Allah, or whatever you want to uh, say, you know, in there. So this, this is a good marker to uh, focus in on. So. Let's talk about how the, what this means in terms of the attack, uh, cultural dimensions and in terms of attacks. So, power distance. I believe this is going to be a secondary characteristic um, because the fact that somebody's attacking your network, they've already been empowered to pretty much do what they wish to do. What will probably happen is, because in what we're, I'm suspecting is going to happen um, is people who are in a, uh, society where they are further removed from power may be a little slower in their decision making and we may be able to pick up on that but not sure yet. Individualism versus collectivism. This I would expect to see, um, this, this should be a major marker here because individuals, you're going to see when individualism is rewarded, you're going to see more risks, bigger steps taken, uh, risk reward, right? So when you say, um, as an individual, I think that you know I'm empowered to go out and uh, create my own attack or make my name for myself, I have incentive to go ahead and do this. I don't have to think about other people. Now, if I have to do this collectively and I'm working in a group, I have, to, and I'm a collectivist. I was grown, raised in a collectivist society. I may say. I have to consult with my teammates first before I do anything. Masculine versus feminine. Um, again, this is not uh, man manly men and girly men and manly women and girly girls. This has to do with aggression. Um, this is going to be an interesting marker because by the very nature of network attacks, you're already in the aggression space. Um, one of the things that Hofstede found in this, uh, on this particular marker was it wasn't that um, women in masculine countries were, um, were so subjugated as much as they found that women, like in the United States, 
where it is a highly masculine country, tend to be a little more aggressive. And of course, men in countries like in the, in the um, like Norway, Sweden, uh, Scandinavian countries that came out high feminine, it's not that they're not uh, masculine at all as much as they are just not as aggressive in uh, various situations. Um, uncertainty avoidance. This is, we suspect this is going to manifest, whoops, sorry, my moose got in the way here. Um, bodyguard got a little ambitious there. Okay, this may manifest itself in behaviors more so than software. Um, uncertainty avoidance, again, is one of those areas where if you're in this space already trying to do attacks, you're pr already pretty happy in the uncertainty area because when you're dealing with uncertainty, that's the areas where you actually come in and start making your, uh, your move on a site, anywhere where there's ambiguity. Indulgence versus restraint, this is a good one um, because this, is, this deals with instant gratification versus waiting until later on your restraint. So would, would, he, uh, would we expect to see something like maybe denial of service attacks filling in on countries that come in high on the instant gratification or the indulgence end? This will be um, interesting to see where this, this one shakes out. And of course, monumentalism versus self-effacement. Do people leave monuments in code? Um, are they bragging? Are they taunting? Are they leaving behind special objects? Anything that can be kind of remotely tied to them because they are proud of what they did. Um, lack of mon monuments can also serve as a clue. If there are no monuments in the code, does this um, imply that maybe I'm dealing with a uh, society that, or a group that does not want to be seen and does not want to be remembered and really is trying to be stealth? More. Uh, issues, concerns, caveats with going down this path. Um, Dr. Guest, uh, Dr. Guest, uh, Dominic Guest down in Florida, um, he's another one who's been incur in very encouraging on this and was really excited when I mentioned this uh, area of study for him. Went on to say, the study of culture and decision making is a relatively new and unexplored field. Note, he said this in 2004, and it's still, um, in terms of the research world, this is a really young area, so getting the, the literature that's needed is not going to be easy, and there's always the fear that things could change. Have to guard against um, s stereotypes. Um, there is. Uh, there is always a little bit of an element of truth in some stereotypes, but the uh, trick is to make sure that we keep the stereotypes in their proper perspective and that the data supports actually what we're seeing and that we don't, let the we don't uh, try to force the data down the path of supporting the stereotype. Network attack activity is inherently an aggressive behavior. And funny thing is, I, I would expect, and so far from what I've seen, there's a disproportional representation by certain countries, like the United States, Australia, where you have, um, again, that high uh, masculinity and high individualist um, markings already. So the fear, of course, is that this could end up skewing our results. Um, the other thing that I have to keep in mind, even something that seems painfully obvious, has to be supported by data. Um, something borrowed, again, the role of reusable code, reusable attacks, people put together attacks and they, they put them up on websites and then anyone has, in the world has access to them. So how does this actually play out with when we're trying to do this? Um, my suspicion when we set the taxonomy is it's going to be something like setting it up so that when the attack is first launched, gathering the information from that and subsequent attack information only if it varies on the variations. Our, the uh, variants will be what is interesting or what will, be, will need to be studied and, and cataloged. Okay, not every area um, may be relevant. We are going to need, in Hofstede's matrix there, um, it's, we may find that some areas are just going to become what we call, what I like to call secondary features of this, uh, secondary characteristics, and that really it's the primary, the, the primary areas and sorting those to the primary from the secondary may become um, a, a bit of a challenge too. Dr. Guest down in Florida, again, I mentioned he was extremely helpful. Um, he should have been in the acknowledgments the, in the beginning, but because I was so scared, I forgot to mention his name. Um, Dr. Guest has done, has taken Hofstede's work and started combining elements together. And what he's done is he really has examined individualism versus collectivism. And he discovered that individualist societies versus collectivist um, uh, values can influence the perception of the problem, the generation of strategies and alternatives, and the selection of one alternative. 
this was, this was again, another key uh, data point because now you've got someone who's actually saying, yes, based on the cultural background, I'm seeing certain behaviors on how they're framing their problem and solving their problem. So how does this relate to network attacks? Well, Dr. Gus um, gathered inputs for his problems from Dr. Hofstede, and what he found was a high degree of individualism correlates to faster decision making while collectivism correlates to proceeding slowly and carefully. How does this, again, how does it go to attacks? Well, we're going to see more aggressive attack behavior from an individualist societies, whereas collaborative ones, you're going to, you may see more incremental. So, one, two things that he's done, uh, two areas where he's really focused his studies are on complex problem solving and dynamic decision making. Both areas that are very important in terms of computer network attacks. Um, trying to attack someone's network and getting to the goodies is not a simple uh, task. Um, and yeah, I know people like to brag and say, yeah, I can get, I own this site in, you know, five seconds, whatever you want to say, you know, I can do this. And, but the reality is it, it is a lot of work and um, it is a bit more complex and we have a cat and mouse game going on. So seeing how people adjust to these different changes and how they actually solve their problem is um, an interesting exercise, I would think. Dynamic decision making is even more fascinating because we have people come into a site and they're going to, um, what happens when you start throwing blocks up? Which way do they go? Do they go right or do they go left? You know, and what, what influences their, um, their choices on that? So, uh, individualism versus collectivism. In individualist cultures, people are confident, one thing that was discovered is people are very confident in their decision-making ability. They don't second-guess themselves. They say, hey, I made the decision, now I'm gonna make it work. Collectivist cultures, there's a lack of trust in decision-making and um, the ability result, this, in decision-making ability, and this results in hypervigilance, avoidance and buck passing. Now, avoidance and buck passing, probably not so much on network attacks, but hypervigilance is very uh, relevant because now you're going to see somebody's going to do something and they're going to make sure that it works. Whereas in a case where someone's confident with what they've done, they said, yeah, I know it's going to work. I'm on to the next thing. Um, we integrated several of Hofstede's areas together, uh, such as long-term um, orientation and power distance. And what he, um, what he had expected was that um, people from a society where there was a collective high power distance with high long-term orientation should do really well in complex problem solving. What he actually found was individualism correlated with risky and expansive strategies. So when you see a bold new attack, it probably, it, the likelihood that it um, originated from a uh, culture where individualism is valued is higher. Collectivism correlated with incremental and defensive strategies. So what we're talking here is the, the individualists will do something different, the collectivists will take something that was, that was different and make it better. Power distance values intensifies or weakens the strategies. Um, so it fed into this whole individualist versus um, collectivist. And so if you have someone who's from a, uh, who has a power distance that, where they're from an egalitarian society and they're in a high individualist um, culture, you would expect them to kind of act like cowboys on the internet when they're attacking. And you may find someone who's um, maybe high on collectivism and low, far away from power in a hierarchical society, you would expect them to be a little more restrained when they're attacking. So how does this all translate? Um, of course, no talk about computer network security is complete without a few art of war, war quotes. Know thy enemy and know yourself. In a hundred battles, you will never peril. Well, we're the first part of knowing the enemy, this is another way of knowing our enemy, uh, just another dimension to it. Those skilled in the art of war subdue the enemy's army without battle. They conquer by strategy. And what we're trying to do is get a step ahead here and understand our enemy, not just what attacks they're going to launch, but um, where the th where's their head. Um, <laughs> I'll give you a, a little side story here. My, my daughter, I love her to death. Um, she, she obviously, you know, she's my daughter. She um, has my husband's personality, so I'm very explosive. And she's an athlete. And every once in a while on the soccer pitch, she, and she's a goalie too, and she just kind of goes off on her teammates when they don't do what they're supposed to do. And um, she, it's, it's all okay after the game, but they, one, at one point somebody asked her, I said, Sample, what goes through your head? 
and of course we ask her that all the time now <laughs> whenever we're uh, having a conversation. And really, this is what we're trying to do. What goes through your head, attacker? Suggests that by understanding cross-cultural thought processes, we may have an additional data point in attack attribution to add to other data points currently in use. Again, we're not trying to replace the hard markers. We're trying to add to what's there in the hard markers. New attacks can be viewed through traditional methods and then mapped to these cultural markers and in the hope that we can gain further insight to our adversaries. We may also be able to determine the adversary's specific weaknesses for explo exploitation. If we understand how they're thinking, maybe we can find their Achilles heel. And of course, the ability to classify attacks by adversary methods offers hope for predictive analysis. And actually, if this is successful, it offers a lot of hope in a lot of other areas. There are so many things that can go on with this, assuming we get through these first steps. So what's the research project? And this is why I'm talking today, because I definitely could, gather, could uh, benefit from other people's opinions on how we can make this better. I think we want to first create a taxonomy of attacks and map to the work by Hofstede, Minkoff, and Guess. And this taxonomy of attacks has to be of attacks that are no, we have known 100% certainty attribution on these attacks. And yes, I know that that will uh, exclude some of the attacks that are more sexy and more recent, like Doku. But it's still a, um, we have to have a basis for building all of this first. So um, I'm hoping that once we create the taxonomy and we start populating it, that we'll be able to quantify results. And when you're starting to quantify your results, then you can look for uh, statistical um, clusters to appear or patterns. Then we create the foundation for further work in this area because once you understand what someone's behavior is and you can tell where the attack is coming from, you will have the ability to cloak yourself if you wish to counterattack um, uh, counter that site and look like maybe another one of their adversaries. Um, I suspect there's going to be a role for this ultimately in assisting in what I call true APT detection and attribution. Uh, I say true APT because I think this is one of the most overused terms right now um, out there and um, sometimes it's, I'm not sure if it's true, if it's really a, um, advanced persistent threat or if it's just persistent threat and somebody just hasn't figured out that they need to maybe change their tactics a bit. Um, so we're also, I think there's a, a way to create better attacks, maybe customize our attacks for our adversaries based on this knowledge. So I, I wanted to run through a couple of examples. Um, I, I loved this one. First of all, I, I, love, um, I love the Brits anyway. So, shoot, they gave us Monty Python. <laughs> so um, here's a case where the Brits came in and they uh, took care of a... Um, uh, they they um, went to the Al-Qaeda website and they wanted to replace how to make bombs. And I, I believe the actual story was that the, they were working in conjunction with the Americans who simply wanted to take down the site. And of course, the Brits got their way. And so let's take a look at this through the prism of uh, cultural dimensions. Okay, so unfortunately there's not a British cheekiness value, but we do have uh, the fact that the Brits scored very high on individualism. Actually, they score higher than us on individualism. Um, and so did the Aussies who actually scored higher than the Brits, but um, that's a whole nother. Anyways, um, so they're high on that. They're low on the power distance. So, of course, it's basically the idea is if you have a clever idea, you can take the ball and run with it. And that's what happened. Um, they're st uh, still researching the indulgence versus self-restraint um, aspect on the UK. Uh, Minkoff did not, ha on the early stuff that I saw on Minkoff, he did not have UK in his uh, matrix yet. Long term, uh, low on long term orientation. Um, not surprising, a lot of the Western cultures, uh, spe uh, specifically um, the ones that were found, um, that were settled by the Brits, uh, the British, former British Empire, don't do quite as well on long term orientation with the exception of Hong Kong. Um, <laughs> this, this, may be, this may be a hint at why the website was defaced instead of simply um, tapped. I mean, if, you ha if you knew people were going to be coming to that website and wanting to make bombs, why not just uh, gather their information and exfiltrate it out so that you could stick local authorities on them? If you already got onto the website anyways, you already owned it. Second one, uh, Stuxnet, probably the most studied worm on uh, the planet right now. 
Um, it targeted specific industrial control systems running Windows, and it had at least four zero-day attacks in it. So what was good about this is we're finding high in creativity, additionally high in funding, so that kind of eliminated a lot of countries from the equation. And it's uh, targeted specific programmable logic controls um, used to control the uranium enrichment by um, altering the centrifuge speed. So this is a very creative attack. Um, so, I think I got ahead of myself, sorry. <laughs> so, um, no one's coming out and saying, yes, 100% certainty, but the fingers have pointed for a while at U.S. and Israel. So, again, U.S. is very high on individualism. Israel is a medium on individualism. Um, medium score by Israel is important, though, because what it indicates is that they are more balanced in terms of they're not only going to do something different, but they'll also filter in the doing it better. And, of course, um, the uniqueness or the idea to do it, um, doing something different is a very U.S. marker. So if you pull these two together, what ends up happening is you say, um, as, one, as Avionics Week um, quoted, Israel can pull talent together from across its industry and military to create a team that can focus on a problem until it is solved. Basically, they can just go at it, and they have, uh, not only do they have the creative mindset to do it, they have the resources and the desire to make it better. Israel also has a very low power distance score, actually a lot significantly lower than the U.S. The uh, U.S. is like in the low to medium range. Israel is like, um, my God, everybody's prime minister, if, if, you, looked at that, um, <laughs> if you looked at their score. Um, it implies that Israel is going to execute faster or before the U.S. Monumentalism versus self-effacing. Now, the U.S. ranked in the middle here, and there are no scores available on Minkoff's work for Israel on this. However, scores tend to cluster around regions, and one of the things that was interesting in Minkoff's results was on his top 10 of regions that um, are highest, the highest in monumentalism, five of the countries were Middle East countries. There's an ongoing debate right now um, about the, is it Mertis or my RTUs? Um, I don't know if anyone is familiar with this. Uh, someone in the New York Times several months ago put out an article about Stuxnet and uh, claimed that there was a biblical reference. And I apologize if it's not Mertes because I'm just a cafeteria Catholic. I don't know anything about Judaism. So, um, but apparently there is this, um, this Mertes is a reference to a book of Esther about some battle between the Persians and the Jews. And um, okay, so that's about all, as far as I can go on that. And then somebody else came up and said, I don't think so. This was a really sophisticated attack, and um, I would think that if someone wants to, you know, it would be really out of character to try to leave a monument in a code piece like this that would uh, lead someone back to you because this is well funded. Um, you know, you, the idea is to be extraordinarily successful here. So maybe what they were really talking about was my RTUs, remote, remote terminal units, to be determined. Of course, our third one, and uh, I should say that when we look at each of these examples, what I did was I, I took one that had 100% certainty, something that had uh, fairly decent certainty on who launched it, and now we have one that is no one really knows. Uh, so let's talk about DoQ for a minute. Uh, these were just some of the headlines that went along with DoQ, and there's a battle going on right now. Some were saying, um, yes, DoQ, it's, it's got Stuxnet code reused, and it was the same people that wrote Stuxnet, and by golly, that's, you know, that's just another phase of it. And some others have come out. Kaspersky uh, Labs came out and said, mm, not so fast there. We're not really sure. And there are some people um, on both sides of this issue who are very knowledgeable on attack attribution and, and attack behaviors. And they can, there's no uh, consensus on what happened here. In fact, um, when I first heard about this attack, my, uh, it was, uh, my friend from Semantic uh, sent me the report like as soon as it came out, and he said, um, looks like Stux, it's the same people that did Stuxnet. And I looked at the report and I said, not so fast. Um, these ones really were working hard. It's totally different goals and objectives here. They're working really hard to remain stealth. Is it possible that maybe some of the Stuxnet code became available to somebody else? Did somebody slip it out? Um, had, is there maybe a developer that was working on Stuxnet that has since left and gone on somewhere else and they, again, slipped out the code with them? Don't know. And um, it's interesting to, it's going to be interesting to watch this one play out. So first item that we noticed was there was uh, still, there's still no attribution. 
A couple of items of interest. The code reuse from Stuxnet, um, is this going down the, are we going to do something better? Does it point to a collectivist behavior? It's going to, I need to find out. D the DOQ extensions, uniformity of your extensions, more of a collectivist thing. The nature of the attack, quiet exfiltration of information as opposed to taking down something or uh, mis getting something to misbehave. And we still don't know when, uh, when everything's going to actually start, uh, if, if it'll come back later and if there's going to be more, uh, more with this. So it's exfiltration without calling attention to the self. It hints at self-effacing behavior or at least a desire to not be seen. So three different attacks, uh, three different attribution levels. Uh, you can see why there might be, you may or may not see why there is a desire to start putting in these other markers and these dimensions into our decision making. What are the next steps? Well, I need to collect the attributed tax um, information and I need to create the taxonomy. And creating the taxonomy is where I could really use an assist from all of you. Um, we, uh, when I'm creating the, the taxonomy, I have to define the grouping by mapping general attack behaviors to cultural dimensions. So where there are monuments left in the code, um, if this was a novel attack, um, or was it an improvement to an existing attack, or was it a creative reuse of an existing attack, it may turn out that it, it falls somewhere in between on, on our, our markers here. What's going to be the scale or the uh, scoring that we're going to use when we actually do this? And then, of course, being able to quantify the results is key so that I can look for clusters. Why should we care? Um, well, attack attribution is much more than simple strike back capabilities. Um, it was funny, I was, I was at a conference, and it was a wonderful conference, and this guy gets up and he's talking about, he's just really quite proud of himself. He runs a porn site, and nobody, uh, nobody attacks his site because as soon as his site gets an attack, they strike right back. I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> Okay, so dude, you have no idea who you're hitting. You don't know if the person was, if, if uh, the, the IP address is actually a legitimate attacker or some poor schmuck whose uh, PC has been taken over. But, uh, as I, and I also pointed, I said, well, you know, maybe in your line of work you can get away with that. Uh, Christ, if the Army tried that, Jesus, we'd have an international incident on our hands. So. Give the, um, so we want to be able to give counterattackers greater certainty in what we're doing. Um, we have the potential to better anticipate attackers' uh, motivations and next moves by understanding what they're doing. And of course, it provides some additional context for our current data. Now, something else that kind of um, just stumbled on this this past week, um, when I initially was thinking, oh God, people are going to think I'm crazy for going down this path, I found out that I'm not alone. Uh, a couple of university uh, students in China put together an analysis of impact Chinese and Western cultural values have on technological innovation. So it's at a Wuhan University of Technology. And guess what? They're using Hofstede's matrix to uh, try to map to this. So what do I need? Uh, more data, of course. Um, attributed attack reports are always helpful. More results on cross-cultural cognitive differences your thoughts on how we, you know, how we can make this better. Any help or support you can give me. Uh, this is, um, I'm working off my Gmail account on this one. You can also reach me at csample.cert.org, but because this was not a CERT sanctioned talk, I didn't put my CERT address up here. And um, I'll open up for any questions or comments. And I want to thank all of you for your time and for not uh, moosing me. <laughs> Yes, in the back. How do you deal with uh, bureaucratic organizations within highly individualistic countries or vice versa? How does that skew the results? Um, so the question was how do we deal with bureaucratic um, organizations or um, governments within individualistic countries and how will that uh, skew the results? What, you would t what I would expect to find in that case would be you may find a creative attack that took a long time to launch. Okay, because the bureaucracy keeps you from being able to, uh, from empowering the attacker or the user. Thanks. Yes? Uh, people spend a lot of time online, have lots of online friends. What do you think is relevant for this uh, reward versus their current social I'm sorry, oh, I missed the third. What do you think is relevant for this? Okay, so um, 
question was, uh, what do I think is the relevance of my, the relative, uh, the relative importance of origins versus, yeah. Okay, so uh, in terms of like your friends, it's, it, it's kind of interesting because um, one of the things that I kind of discovered before I even went down this path is that when you're talking with people, your friends from other countries, um, it's, it's funny, one, first how you, you'll have different expressions that mean the same thing, and the other one is um, you will, um, oh God, I just had a senior moment. <laughs> The, um, okay, so first you'll have these different expressions that, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll go down that path. You'll have different expressions that mean the same thing. For example, um, you said you're uh, Cuban, right? Well, I have a couple of friends in Ireland and a couple of friends in England that I like to talk to online. Now, um, one day I was talking to one of my friends in Ireland, and he said something like, um, I, I can't even remember what I had done, but he, his remark was, uh, he said, oh yeah, I remember that. Big smile is what you had on that day. Now. <laughs> Luckily, my husband wasn't in the room because I think he would have said, well, I hope you had more on than a smile. But um, <laughs> this, this person was actually referring to the fact that I was having a good time and it was apparent to all that I had apparently trapped somebody in something. Now, of course, if I had that conversation with a British friend, he'd say, oh, you had a jolly good time on that, didn't you? Or you, yeah, I took the, took the piss out of someone. Um, and of course, if, we, if it were an American, they'd turn around and say, you know, well, we had a great time, didn't we? You know, and he'd just write, write straight, on, uh, straight on it with you. We've, uh, the second part was, I found that when we are working with people from different countries, a lot of times you're getting to the same end point, but you're getting there in different paths. Um, you find this a lot of times when you're collaborating on projects. Um, you'll say, wow, I think, you know, I think we should do it this way, and someone else will say, no, we should do it this way. And, and oftentimes you'll have two groups that will form and they'll do things differently and they still get to the same end result. So uh, that's really, I think, more relevant to your question, that you're, you're finding different ways to get there, but you're all getting to the same end point. And by the way, I love your sweatshirt. That's my favorite, my, one of my favorite teams. So. <laughs> yes? It's, it's actually focused more on the strategies than the code, although the code will be examined when it's available. The goal right now is simply to create the taxonomy. Oh, by the way, the question was um, how do we focus, uh, our, how are we dealing with the fact that we will have uh, cross, basically, it sounds like cross-cultural collaboration, right? Is that, okay, so um, the goal right now is just to create the taxonomy to see where everything fill, uh, falls out and to see if there is actually something to this. I, I believe there is probably going to be something to it, but I also believe it's going to have to get tuned. Yes? Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. So, yeah, I definitely will check that paper out. And really, like, uh, when you think about this, this is not really revolutionary in, in that people, uh, there are countries have been doing this in the general battlefield. Though it's different is the idea of taking this to the cyber battlefield. So, thank you. The long war, right? Long but, war. Okay, by Rand. I mean, they, they discovered all kinds of things that, that they uh, later applied in other parts of the world. Uh, I, uh,
and The witch attack? Okay. 